Hello, everyone. Dr. Chris Martinson here. The lab leak hypothesis for COVID. It's back on the table. Come on, let's go take a look at it. Hello, everyone. Dr. Chris Martinson here. We're going to be talking about the lab leak hypothesis for COVID. By the way, one of my personal mottos is I'd rather be a year early than a day late. In this case, on this particular hypothesis, I was a year and two weeks early. The rest of the world is finally catching up to what you knew if you were following this channel on May 1st of 2020 and also on May 4th. I covered this topic and the science, the data behind the lab leak hypothesis pretty extensively back then. Let's go take a look at it. This is episode 005, the COVID lab leak. That means it uh, looks like the lab leak hypothesis is back on the menu, boys and girls. So let's go take a look at it. Now, before we go there, I'm going to ask you if you want to follow this channel and be sure you can, you're going to want to come by the website, Peak Prosperity, and uh, at least register. It's free. That way we have your email. Listen, you know, I run the risk of being censored because sometimes being a year early with information is not what the narrative machine, not what the nudging oligarchy actually wants. They want their narratives delivered when they want, not earlier. Uh, and we have a habit of being early here, which is frowned upon uh, in the world of big tech censorship these days. So come on by Peak Prosperity with no censorship there, at least not for data or solid ideas. Obviously, we'll censor nutcases and people with super objectionable opinions, but uh, not if they're backed by data. Um, so at any rate, come join the tribe. You're invited. And uh, if you do register, that way we can stay in touch. Now, what happened? The lab leak dam broke, and it breaks here with the Wall Street Journal article that just came out uh, fairly recently here on May 23rd. All right, let me just get my drawing tool out here. All right, looks like I got it. Now the lab uh, leak dam breaks with this Wall Street Journal article. They talked about intelligence on six staff at the Wuhan lab uh, fuels debate on COVID-19 origin. I have no idea why this particular thing would have fueled debate because there's a lot of other debate that could be fueled. But anyway, I'll take it. If this is what's going to cause the debate to get fueled. Let's go with it. They say here uh, three researchers from China's Wuhan Institute of Virology became sick enough in November of 2019 that they sought hospital care. According to a previously undisclosed U.S. intelligence report that could add weight to growing calls for a fuller probe of whether the COVID-19 virus may have escaped from the laboratory. Um, so listen, uh, let me check my confirmation bias at the door. Yes, obviously, I think that we should have a complete investigation of the lab leak hypothesis. But note what we have here again is we have unnamed, undisclosed. I don't like that stuff. Um, we have too much of that unnamed, undisclosed. Who are these intelligence agencies and why now? Why all of a sudden now? But here we are. I'll leave those questions for later. A uh, little bit of speculation. And by the way, You'll, you'll love this. So it, now that now that now that the lab leak hypothesis is back on the table, uh, Facebook lightened right up. Uh, they end their bans on posts asserting that COVID nineteen was man made. I, so I back up my assertions with data. So we did get banned and shadow banned and uh, meaning shadow banned meaning we would put posts up, but they wouldn't hardly get any views. Uh, we saw our subscriber count here on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube instead of over at Peak Prosperity. We watched it stagnate and flatline because we were talking about objectionable content, including this kind of content, which was not uh, really enjoyed by the likes of Facebook, uh, which for reasons that are completely mysterious uh, or at least illogical, because I don't think they could defend them, saying they are going to block any conversations around the idea that COVID-19 was man-made. Hey, if they want to go ahead and block stuff where people then assert that it was a bioweapon or it was done to harm people intentionally or, or speculate about intent, that's fine. But they blocked data, actual hard data. We'll cover a tiny bit of that here, but um, just a tiny bit, just enough to make the point. By the way, we're going to talk about some stuff here that may sound political, but I'm not political. I don't do left-right I do up, down, uh, left, right. There's good people on the left, good people on the right. There's bad people on the left, bad people on the right. Good ideas on both sides, bad ideas on both sides. You know what I care about? Up, down. Do we have integrity or are we stuck in some rigid ideology? Uh, and by rigid ideology, I think of things where you're not allowed to hold anything other than the orthodoxy approved opinions that the state, that the culture, that the university, uh, whatever the thing happens to be, only allow those particular things. I object to all that. I like integrity, which means free thought. 
highest form of integrity you can have is the complete ability and willingness to be re-educated at any moment in time. You got to be solid. You have to be a solid person in your own system to be able to say, wow, I just got completely re-educated on something I thought I knew some things about. All right. So this, everything that follows, it's not political. Uh, so let's start. Well, uh, Biden stopped the lab leak investigation. This just came out and check this out. What a turn of events. CNN, which was uh, very, very solidly anti-Trump, as we know, all and so therefore, ergo, uh, very solidly pro-Biden, all of a sudden saying something that's a little anti-Biden here, talking about how Pompeo, uh, the former Secretary of State-led effort to hunt down COVID lab theory, was shut down by the Biden administration over concerns about the quality of the evidence. Hmm. Is that why they shut it down? It's interesting. So we'll save that question for a bit later, too. President Joe Biden's team shut down a closely held State Department effort launched late in the Trump administration to prove the coronavirus originated in a Chinese lab. Not a Chinese lab, the Wuhan Institute of Virology over there in Wuhan, you know, right where the whole thing started. Um yeah, it's, it's just, uh, anyway, I don't know why they, they're, they're dodging that a tiny bit. Uh, they did this over concerns, they say here, about the quality of its work, according to three sources familiar with the decision. So three sources, uh, and that's what they came out with. They say here they continue on the existence of a State Department inquiry and its termination this spring by the Biden administration, neither of which has been previously reported comes to light amid renewed interest in whether the virus could have leaked out of a Wuhan lab with links to the Chinese military. Now, that's interesting twist on this. The Biden administration is also facing scrutiny of its own efforts to determine if the Chinese government was responsible for the virus. This is really important because I don't know if you remember, but I do as part of the whole election cycle. Uh, there were concerns about um, the ties that a lot of people have had to China. And there's always the question, it, in politics, you want to avoid the appearance, if not the reality, of having a conflict of interest, particularly around a topic this important. Where this virus came from is super important. We just destroyed an entire year of children's lives. We shut down economies. We destroyed small and medium-sized businesses. Where this virus came from is actually a very important, some would say, one of the most important questions you could possibly ask. And in the midst of this increased heat around inquiry into where it actually came from, the Biden administration said, hey, you know what? We're going to stop that investigation. Well, that turned out that didn't fare too well. They thought they could do it on the QT, but three people at least leaked it to CNN, as we see. And then what happened? Uh, Biden panicked. Uh, they, After CNN reveals he canceled COVID origins investigation, he orders immediately a 90 day, 90 days, give me a report from U.S. intel agencies. So that was a Rapid turnaround right there. Uh, that backpedaling, um, I don't know which U.S. intelligence agencies he's uh, put on the job here, but I got to tell you, we had this data well over a year ago at this point in time. It's pretty solid. So it's interesting they said they had bad data. I got good data. <laughs> Call me. Call me, Joe. I got great data. Uh, you, you're going to love it. Um, and they say here uh, in a statement via the White House website, the Biden administration claims that officials have been pursuing various possibilities hmm. <laughs> after just shutting it down, uh, including whether it emerged from human contact with an infected animal mm, or from a laboratory accident. How about we leave the word accident out of there? We just say came from a laboratory and then you, we can decide intent later. That would be a second part of the uh, investigation. But for now... Question one is, where did this thing come from? So we'll show you some of that data real quick. Uh, it's clear the administration, they say here, is in full damage control mode. Um, and he's given them 90 days to draw a definitive conclusion and get back to him. Listen, you don't need 90 days for this. Uh, but <laughs> what we do have here is uh, we have the Biden administration. Uh, you know, it's time to break out my old favorite, the bus. Uh, <laughs> only this time, it's the Biden bus. And uh, what we're going to do here, it is time for that bus, the policy bus, to back that thing right on up. So uh, stopped the investigation into where this was coming from and then had to reverse course just within 24 hours. That's how big the political heat is right now. I got to tell you, this is actually a very seminal moment to watch um, how this has all happened and how it's transpired because the speed of it suggests that there are really powerful forces, very powerful forces, deciding to look into this. 
hey, I'm glad they are. As a reminder, this was bait way back uh, May 4th, 2020. Um, I had another one, some earlier stuff that I found. I was investigating this uh, pretty much by the end of April. And then I put this out. I called this one lying virologist and self-inflicted wounds. Um, th it was so obvious at the time that there were clear evidence that needed to be looked into in terms of talking about this is coming from a laboratory setting. So where do we go with this? All right. I just got to tell you, this is flashback. Really nice job by uh, Grabby in here, the website. Uh, let's just tune in. This is uh, from all this stuff from a year ago. Listen to the tone of how this was being reported pretty much at the same time I was telling you, here's the data. It looks like solid data that it could have come from a lab. Okay, this is what's Question going on. about the Wuhan lab. We know that it's been debunked. Those same agencies now have been tapped with investigating one of Trump world's most favorite conspiracy theories. This week, Donald Trump is still pushing the debunked bunkum, despite his own... The debunked bunkum. <laughs> intelligence community's <laughs> findings that that is simply not true. And there is simply no reason to believe that that, that is the case. Simply not true. There's simply no reason. I wonder if some focus group came up with the idea that simply was the right word to, to insert. There is no empirical evidence to verify that. Coming up with a conspiracy theory to try and foment xenophobia um, with respect to um, the Chinese has just as much factual support as taking Clorox. He can't just... Uh, <laughs> I love that one. Yeah, if you have, if you believe in this conspiracy theory about the lab leak, that has as, just as much evidence as uh, drinking Clorox, which, by the way, nobody ever suggested to drink Clorox. That itself is bunkum. So hat tip, free tip to you uh, Facebook people out there watching this right now. If you wanted to identify and tag misinformation and news organizations that ought to get timeouts and ought to be barred, there's, this is an assembled clip of those people right now because this is all misinformation. Sit back and we'll let the tip. doctors and the scientists do their jobs. He's got to chime in. He may pick up the conspiracy theory that this was some weapon. People don't keep back. Why a weapon? Why? Why? why you, that you? You just add that in. That's called the straw man uh, fallacy argument, right? It's like, well. Chris, you, you say you think there's evidence that came from a lab. So you, so what's your theory for why this bioweapon was, was specifically released to harm old people in nursing homes? Like, what? Whoa, pack that bus up. That's a really old, uh, obvious tactic for uh, spreading disinformation and misinformation. Caps, it's complete baloney. We don't need... A uh, complete baloney. That was, that was Dayzak. That's the gentleman who would be actually right at the top of the list of people I'd most want to ask questions to about what he was up to in that uh, WIV laboratory with the bad lady. To invoke conspiracy theories. This is just another example of, of the president trying to change the narrative from his own failings. The problem for President Trump is that he's running for re-election, is looking for ways to deflect blame for uh, the performance of the administration. If you look at the evolution of the virus in bats and what's out there now, it's very, very strongly leaning towards this could not have been artificially or deliberately manipulated. Oh, question about the oh, Wuhan. oh, 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 <laughs> oh, okay, Tony, back that bus up. Uh, the very, very strong evidence that this could not have been artificially manipulated. Actually, the opposite is completely the case. And he knows that he's more in the position to know this than anybody. There are endless videos. Go on YouTube. Search Fauci gain a function. You can find him leading seminars, talking to conventions of people who are actually engaged in gain of function research back in 2015, 14, 13. Gain of function has been a big part of his life. He's been fun. He's been proponent of it. He's his organization's been funding it. I'm sure he knows exactly what it's all about. This statement from him at this point in time is not just evasive. It's completely, obviously false information from this gentleman. So hold on to that because we're going to ask some questions about what that ought to mean. And by the way, we can go into this just a little bit more on the Fauci side because um, get this drawing tool back. April 3rd, 2020, he says, I think we should shut down those things. That's the wet markets in, in China right away. It boggles my mind how when we have so many diseases that emanate out of that unusual human animal interface that we don't just shut it down. 
Fauci told Kilmeade, what we're going through right now is a direct result of that. So you can see the spin cycle here. You have all the media is just absolutely 100% convincing you that it's, you're a nut, that you might as well be drinking bleach, that it's a conspiracy theory, that nobody agrees with this idea that it could have been anything but natural. And then you have Fauci here in April saying, hey, you know what? Th this thing must have come from a wet market. We're sure about that. By the way, we already had solid data from China by then saying that it didn't come from the wet market, that they had evidence that it had originated earlier than that. Patient zero was never isolated to the wet market. Patient zero being the first identified case of COVID. Very important. You find patient zero, good chance of figuring out where this thing came from. So he knew that this was actually false at the time, knew that this did not come from the wet market, knew that but said this anyway. April 17th, Fauci said, there was a study recently that we can make available to you where a group of highly qualified evolutionary virologists looked at the sequences of the novel coronavirus and the sequences in bats as they evolve and the mutations that it took to get to the point where it is now is totally consistent with a jump of a species from an animal to a human. Actually, that's not true. It's not even close to true. In fact, the sequences have a lot of interesting data in them, which we surfaced way back a long time ago, including this one. Note to journalists, this is called PRRA. This is a sequence. Here we have SARS-CoV-2, this closest known relative, which may or may not have been a fictitious thing because it's just a sequence in a database that the WIV released. But this is called the RAT T R A T G 13 the RAT G13. Uh, so-called sequence, but we've got the pangolin uh, coronaviruses here. We've got the human SARS-CoV. That's classic SARS. Uh, we've got uh, these bat SARS-CoV related things. These sequences across all of these viruses line up perfectly. They're always the same, except for this little insert right here, PRRA. That's a sequence of four amino acids. That would have been a 12 nucleotide insert into the genomic structure. And that is a very odd sequence. Why? Because that's called a polybasic furin cleavage site. It's a very highly known thing that's put in to viruses for gain of function research because that furin cleavage site, furin's a, a human um, we have a lot of circulating protease in our body, and that protease, when it clips that particular sequence, it makes the virus get into the cell hundreds, if not thousands of times more efficiently and effectively. So that sequence right there, when Tony said, hey, all of our virologists are looking and saying the sequence clearly say this came from an animal to a human, we don't have any natural analog of human SARS-CoV-2. There's nothing in nature that's close to it that has that sequence, but that sequence is put in all the time by gain of function researchers uh, and including the, the H1N1 uh, virus, that, which is an influenza virus. They put that sequence in or something very much like it and it scared the bejesus out of everybody to the point that under the Obama administration, they terminated gain of function research because it was so scary. If that virus had escaped from the lab, that particular influenza, that would have been the Spanish flu times 10 in terms of impact. Um, anyway, so that's the sequence data. It was sitting there. And by the way, just to show you, um, this is SARS-CoV-2, this little clad of pink right here. There's there's some some that little wedge right there. Here are all of its closest relatives. So this is kind of, we're looking at a family tree. This is like saying, um, you know, everybody in my family is a bit like I am, Swedish, sort of fair-skinned, blue-eyed, and this is our family tree going back like eight generations. And then all of a sudden there's a baby born in my family, which is uh, which has completely different features from anything we might have, like like very dark skin or something like that. And or a very different eye color structure or is just massively taller and everybody in my family is short or vice versa. Just it didn't share the family structure uh, from the family tree. So. That nobody has an explanation for why this thing all by itself, way out there, is parked all by itself. You can't, your first instinct ought to be, um, this looks a little fake. It doesn't look natural. Your first instinct should not be, hey, this, this totally says it's natural. But that's the direction things went. So here's how something like the lab function would have been made, right? One possible method. I talked about this on May 12th in 2020. You can look this on YouTube if it stays up. Uh, one possible method. You create these things called chimeras where you take a piece of one virus and a piece of another virus. You stitch them together and then you see what happens. Don't forget when you stitch them together, make sure you put that little polybasic furin cleavage site right between a couple of the S subunits on that. 
My preferred method for this would have been they would have taken the RAT TG13 backbone. They would have put in a pangolin receptor binding domain, RBD, on that because that we have 100% identity between a pangolin receptor binding domain, which, by the way, has very high affinity for the human ACE2 receptor. 100% identity between that and what we see in SARS-CoV-2, but the rest of it kind of looks like this thing up here. So you create that chimera. Uh, you put the polybasic furin cleavage site in there, three quick steps. You do that all in test tubes. Then you run it through cell cultures, human cell cultures for a while. You cycle it. That's what that little circle on top is. You cycle it around. And then you put it into an animal model. Back in 2020, I was thinking, hey, ferrets, but this was pretty early on. Now, now I think a little bit different. I think they probably, uh, I was pretty sure they put that into what are called humanized mouse models where they take a mouse, they knock out its native gene for ACE2, so that's the mouse or the murine ACE2 receptor, you knock it out. And then you slip back in a gene that's actually from a human ACE2, and now you have a mouse that's a perfect little mouse, except it has a human component that's been stuck in there. They're called knockout mice. Look them up. You can actually order them from places like Jackson Laboratory or whatnot. Whichever, you, you can have them with knockouts in immune functions, knockouts for different subcomponents, knockouts for specific proteins. They're really handy for studying human uh, disease models. They're very handy. That's what they probably did here is uh, they probably did a, a knockout and were testing this virus on mice that had human ACE2. And that's how this virus got to be super duper isolated and specific for human ACE2. In fact, this virus, if it did come from a natural source, like they're claiming, like Tony likes to say, it would be the first one of which I'm aware where it binds more tightly to the human ACE2 than to any other animal receptor type out there. That's kind of weird. Usually the virus optimizes for the species it's in, and then it's kind of a suboptimal jump for the next one. I mean, it can make the jump, but it's not quite as good when it gets there. Know what I'm saying? All right. So... Uh, so the, the Wall Street Journal now gets with the facts here. Uh, so May 26 here, they just reported that President Biden on Wednesday ordered U.S. intelligence to dig deeper into the origins of COVID-19, a reversal after he reportedly ordered a State Department investigation unit shut down. So um, this is what the Wall Street Journal is coming up with. Very nice opinion piece. They go through a lot of the actual data in this, and they're saying the evidence, the evidence catches up to Fauci and other Wuhan COVID deniers. Wow, that's a turn of events. Uh, Fauci is on the heels, and so are all those other lying virologists. And you know who you are, you virologists who uh, trounced me on uh, Twitter, who trounced all the other fine researchers out there who were trying to look at the data objectively around the lab leak hypothesis, who claimed authority, who said, this is what happens when you let amateurs try and look at the data. Trust us, we're the experts who put out flawed reasoning, if not fraudulent reasoning, to explain their must-have-come-from-nature hypothesis. Methinks the senator doth protest too loudly. Many of them were just way too strident. You know who you are. I'm not going to name names here, but oh my gosh, there are some apologies due. And if you were um, going to try and resurrect your reputations, that's what you'd do. Yeah, if I were you, I'd get out in front of this um, because clearly the tide has turned. I don't know why it turned. Kind of glad it did. Um, they say here, too, the public health clerisy, I love that term, the public health clerisy also set boundaries for allowable discussion on February 19th, 2020. The Lancet published a statement by scientists condemning conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. Should be a familiar phrase. We've talked about this just a couple of episodes ago. Uh, this is about the Dayzak article, right? Um, although some academics quietly dissented, the document was promoted as proof that the lab possibility was debunked. All right, quick aside. From this point forward, if if you come forward with facts or I come forward with facts and somebody says conspiracy, I'm not even going to let them finish the sentence because that means they're actually not interested in the data. They're just trying to shut the conversation down. Or if they use the word debunked, they shouldn't get the whole word out before you before you just like turn away and, and, and leave the conversation. Because it turns out that all these conspiracy theories have become conspiracy facts this year. And uh, all these things that have been debunked weren't debunked. Right. And that includes Dwizabin one and two, especially and particularly. All right. So, uh, by the way, who's not on board? Others are still clinging desperately to incoherent silliness. So here's a Purva Mandavili. 
Um, someday we will stop talking about the lab leak theory and maybe even admit its racist roots. But alas, that day is not yet here. That's May 26, 2021. This isn't, that's, that's so, such a 2020 quote. Hey, Apoorva. Oh, by the way, this is the reporter for the New York Times on mainly COVID-19. So why the New York Times is so bent on protecting uh, China and going through this silly route? This is just incoherent silliness, Apoorva. This idea that it's racist to talk about the origin of where this might have come from a lab, that's not racist. It's, uh, it's an important conversation in science. Uh, and it's interesting. Quick aside, this always drove me nuts because they said it had to be named COVID-19 when it should have been called the Wuhan virus, right? Because every other virus, Rift Valley, um, West Nile, are actually named for where they originated from. Just not this time because they didn't want this to be, uh, that would have had racist overtones. And they were serious about that. New York Times, it's racist to call this the Chinese virus, the Wuhan virus, any of that stuff. But meanwhile, have you heard about the South African variant? Have you heard about the Indian variant? Have you heard about the Brazil variants? Somehow it's okay to name the variants where they came from. That's not racist, but this is. That's why it's incoherent. There's no coherence in that. Like, this one's racist, that's not. I can't keep track, y'all. How about we just do things by logic and convention? Can, can we just do that? So I was going to prepare this, like, whole big giant, like, conclusion for today. And it turns out my conclusions from May 1st, 2020, I'll just stand by them. Um, here's one. The press needs to ask one question and no others until this is answered, which is, how did that polybasic furin cleavage site, PRRA, get into COVID-19? Just keep asking that. Just that. If, if, if way back in May of 2020, the press had done its job, you listening, Aperva? had done its job and asked this question over and over again, I think we could have got somewhere. And why is this important? Because if you knew that this was created in a lab and you knew that this virus, unlike other natural viruses, had a really strong affinity for human ACE2, but not just human ACE2. This thing comes in through the CD147 receptor as well. It also comes in through neuropillin 1. It comes in through a variety of gates in human cells, and we need to know that. If it comes from a natural source, I don't think we're quite as tuned up for the idea of just what a beast this particular honey badger virus could be. That's why this is a really important question. Secondarily, wouldn't it be great to say maybe there ought to be penalties for countries that engage in gain-of-function research and do it poorly or shoddily? Maybe there ought to be consequences for unleashing something like this on the world. Maybe maybe humans ought not to be doing gain-of-function research at all. Um, I also said way back then, a year ago, I'm very disappointed with the dissembling and overt lying and CYA behavior of what appears to be a significant portion of the U.S. virology community. Very disappointed in you guys and gals. That, that was just awful the way you um, chucked science and basic inquiry and open minds aside to try and force through a point of view around how this had to be natural. It was, it was, it was, you started with a conclusion first and then force fit data into that worldview. Not science. Very dis disappointing. Well, uh, at least those virologists who are monkeying around with gain of function. Uh, by the way, I don't want to throw all the virologists under the bus. Some of, some of you have done a fantastic job of keeping abreast with us and keeping an open mind. But you know, some of you didn't. And I think the virology community needs to do a little self-policing about its, uh, uh, who, <laughs> Who did what in this particular story? Both the U.S. and China, though, I got to be clear, I made this conclusion over a year ago. Both the U.S. and China are up to their virologist eyeballs in this story. As you know now, if you've been following this, it turns out that the United States, through uh, some NIAID grants, through a place called EcoHealth Alliance, funneled money that ended up at the Wuhan Institute of Virology to perform research that looks, smells, tastes, and sounds an awful like gain-of-function research where they were using humanized mouse models and chimeric virus um, constructs on coronaviruses in order to investigate uh, SARS-like uh, illnesses. So that was all happening through the Institute of Virology. And by the way, it's not just the 600000 that got funneled through on that one uh, $6 million grant through the EcoHealth Alliance. The EcoHealth Alliance also received a ton of money from the U.S. Department of Defense and the State Department. Lots of money. How much? One report I read placed it at over $100 million. Um, so it's a big chunk of change. Hey, guess what? These sorts of studies, they should never have been done. That's my conclusion. That's my opinion around all of this. 
Um, and so my final questions for the day, I'd said I'd, I'd get to them first. What should the penalties be, do you think, for lying about performing or funding this kind of research? Hmm? What should the penalties be for performing or funding this research and or then lying about it? I think they ought to be pretty significant. I think there ought to be really serious penalties for this. And secondarily, another question might be, should the investigation findings be made public? What do you think about that? Let's answer that in, um, in the comments below. Or if you're watching the premiere of this, we can just do it in the chat window. It should be right over there. Um, and uh, so do you think those investigation findings should be, be, be made public no matter how bureaucratically embarrassing they might be? And by the way, bureaucratically embarrassing is often called a matter of national security. Sometimes national security, I get it, there's legit issues in national security, but far too often it smells like bureaucratically embarrassing, least embarrassing stuff to me, and I don't think that's how that should be run. Uh, let that stuff out. I think this should all be released. I think we deserve to know what happened. I think that our lives were impacted. I think we deserve to know. And finally, of course I have this question, where did that polybasic PRRA furin cleavage site come from? Where? That's the that's the operative question. All right. So as we wind up here, I just want to remind you that if you if you like knowing things way in advance, uh, you should come in and join us. So that's who we are. I I have a superpower. I I figure stuff out really early. I don't you know it's just it's just logic. So a lot of the people who belong to uh, Peak Prosperity. We enjoy knowing what's happening in advance. We think there are huge, enormous changes coming to the world, and we want to know about them in advance so we can prepare ourselves financially, physically, emotionally. We think there's real, predictive, explanatory, and most importantly, resilience and protective power for knowing things in advance. So that's what we do. I invite you to come and join us. And with that, I'm going to leave you with this one final message because I got to tell you, my spidey senses are telling me that it's going to be really important that we know exactly where our food is coming from in the near future. So with that, I'll leave you with this, and we'll see you next time. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Honey Badger Farms. As we swivel around, I'm going to introduce you to my soil management experts over here. They're helping us, Evie and myself, produce better soil out here in the field. Something I think it's really, really critical is learning how to garden, to be able to grow our own food. And I want you to consider coming this June 25th and 26th to Polyface Farms in Virginia. Joel Salatin's amazing place for a day of couple days of learning all about running a successful farm, farming operation, small garden, homestead, whatever you got. I'm going to be there. And so are a bunch of other key influencers at Peak Prosperity, big tribe assembling. So consider coming if you would. If you're interested, click this link right here or the one down below in the description. I hope to see you there. It's going to be a fantastic time. See you then.